Welcome to lecture number five, Anonymous Speech, Heroes, Wrongdoers, and Internet Trolls. Few subjects on the internet today generate as much debate and passion as the issue of whether anonymous speech is a good or bad thing. Proponents and opponents alike can readily marshal compelling examples supporting their respective views. The issue is particularly nettlesome because it often requires harmonizing the competing interests of privacy, transparency, accountability, civility, and the First Amendment rights of free speech and a free press. This video briefly addresses four aspects of anonymous speech and will serve as background for this week's class discussion on the role and value of anonymous speech on the Internet. First, we will review the historical roots of anonymous speech in America. Second, we will outline the legal protections that are afforded anonymous speakers. Third, we will identify some well-known anonymous heroes and cowards. And finally, we will discuss the internet culture of opaque usernames and handles and how that culture is at odds with the current trend of requiring real names on social networking sites. For centuries, anonymous commentators have addressed social, religious, and political controversies and have been catalysts for change. The Federalist Papers, so influential in our democracy, were penned by anonymous authors. C.S. Lewis and Ben Franklin wrote under assumed names. And well-known authors Mark Twain, Lewis Carroll, and George Orwell are actually pen names. The muckraking journalists who wrote about government corruption in the 1920s and 30s often used pseudonyms. The anonymous source known as Deep Throat revealed the criminal conduct of the committee to re-elect President Nixon and brought down a presidency in what was known as the Watergate scandal. More recently, we have seen dissidents in the Middle East, protected through anonymity, use social media to foster democratic movements in the so-called Arab Spring of 2011. In short, anonymous speech, originally used by pamphleteers, but now used by commenters on the Internet, is deeply ingrained in our history as a country and as a people. Legal protections for anonymous speakers have been recognized both under our federal constitution and various state statutes. The United States Supreme Court has held that the First Amendment rights of free speech and a free press provide substantial protection to anonymous speech. For example, in McIntyre v. Ohio Elections Commission, decided in 1995, the court struck down an Ohio law that prohibited the distribution of anonymous campaign material. The court recognized the important role that anonymity often plays in the exercise of free speech and noted that under our Constitution, anonymous pamphleteering is not a pernicious, fraudulent practice but an honorable tradition of advocacy and dissent. Anonymity, said the court, is a shield from the tyranny of the majority. In Buckley v. American Constitutional Law Foundation, a case decided in 1999, the court again recognized the value of anonymity when it struck down a requirement that petition circulators must wear identification badges stating their names. The court noted that the law infringed upon free speech by compelling identification, quote, at the precise moment when the circulator's interest in an anonymity is the greatest, end of quote. And in 1997, the court in Reno v. ACLU made it clear that the First Amendment right to anonymous speech applied fully to Internet speech. This principle was later reaffirmed by the court in 2010 when the court allowed an anonymous blogger to sue for violation of his civil rights when law enforcement wrongfully obtained his identity via a criminal subpoena to the blogger's internet service provider. But the right of anonymity is not absolute and is often balanced against other rights, such as the government's right to regulate false advertising and the right of an aggrieved party to seek judicial redress for an injury. 
As a consequence, the right to unmask the anonymous speaker who engages in deceitful commercial speech or who libels or slanders someone has been recognized. This is a developing area of the law and also implicates various statutory laws enacted by states to protect reporters' confidential sources, so-called shield laws. Utah recognizes a limited right of journalists to protect anonymous sources by court rule. Let's now briefly identify some recent anonymous heroes and cowards. Two famous examples of anonymous heroes readily come to mind. The first is Deep Throat, a Watergate fame, who exposed the criminal acts of the committee to re-elect Richard Nixon. A more recent example, and one that involves the Internet, is Wild Gonam, the now famous Egyptian whose Facebook page, created under a fictitious name, inspired thousands to join in popular uprisings against oppressive governments in Egypt, Tunisia, and Yemen. In both these examples, if their identities were known, it is doubtful they would have come forward. These are two examples of the positive side of anonymity. Anonymity on the Internet has a dark side, however, in that it often enables anonymous persons to inflict harm without accountability. Let's look at some recent examples. The anonymous person who created a fake Facebook page, ostensibly of a Hawaii Supreme Court nominee, and then posted racist comments in an effort to hijack her confirmation. The anonymous person who intentionally tried to harm Britton Heller by posting a message thread titled, Stupid Bitch to Attend Yale Law, on a law-related website and falsely stating that she had bribed her way into law school and had had a lesbian affair with a school administrator. And perhaps the most infamous internet troll, Violent Acres, who posted sexualized images of underage girls on several Reddit threads he created entitled Jailbait and Creep Shots. The persons involved in the first two examples remain unknown. Violent Acres was recently outed by Gawker Online Magazine in a lengthy story about internet trolls that is part of your assigned reading. The internet fosters uninhibited and robust speech and the use of internet handles is commonplace. For example, my Twitter handle is Media Law Guy. This is not to hide my identity, as my real name and photo are displayed, but it is a way to describe myself in shorthand to those who read my tweets. People often have an online persona that is markedly different than their real-world image, and they want to maintain that separation. For example, the third-grade teacher who writes racy romance novels under a pseudonym understandably wants to keep her life as a writer private from her students and perhaps fellow teachers. Pseudonyms are frequently used, often for legitimate reasons. Members of marginalized communities, such as the LGBT community, people with disabilities, or victims of sexual abuse often want to express themselves, but without the danger of rejection or discrimination. But the freedom that anonymity enables has come with a price. Anonymity, unfortunately, has spawned incivility, emboldened trolls, and allowed a growing number of persons to inflict harm without accountability. As a consequence, several states have made it a crime to create a fake online profile for the purpose of harming another. And many social networking sites have adopted a real names policy, most notably Facebook, Google+, and more recently, YouTube. These reactions to the abuses of anonymity have themselves been controversial and will help inform our discussion this week on the role and value of anonymous speech. Our next video will address a related subject, John and Jane Doe litigation.